It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck, and welcome once again in the front row. I'm your host, Mike Vaccaro. Behind the scenes, as always, J.R. Quitman, our creator, producer, and director. This is a CLNS Media Network podcast. Be sure to check out clnsmedia.com for more great shows. And also, we remind you and invite you to subscribe, to like, and to share to help us grow our show. Well, we're up to episode number 69. We're back to football and back to a great story here. Carl Mecklenburg, he came from Minnesota. He was drafted in the 12th round. Doesn't exist anymore in the NFL, but he made it on the roster of the Denver Broncos and became one of the all-time great defensive players in Denver, helping lead the Broncos to three Super Bowl trips, 12 years with the Broncos, He's in the ring of fame as well. A great story that he shares with us today. We also hear about his nickname, the Albino Rhino. Where'd it come from? Stay tuned to find out. It's episode number 69 of In the Front Row featuring Carl Mecklenburg. Well, well Carl, thanks so much for spending a little time with us here today. And uh, in preparing for this, just reading about your story. I mean, again, I knew your name. I knew, you know, what you did with the Broncos, but uh, just an amazing background and and so much more amazing to see where you came from. And, and let's start at the beginning for you. You're born in Seattle, but you really grew up, I guess, in Minnesota, right? When, when did you yeah. make that my move? Dad, my dad was in the Army. So, okay. Uh, so we moved around a little bit. And uh, I uh, I spent most of my childhood in Minnesota, though. Uh, the family was originally from Minnesota. Um, I had one brother born in uh, Maryland. I was born in Seattle. and <laughs> That's just kind of how it worked. Nine years old, I guess, is when you first start playing football. What, what was it about football at that time, at that early age, that really drove you to that sport? I, I love football. I, you know, truthfully, my favorite sport as a kid was hockey. Uh, growing up in Minnesota, that was, the, that was the big sport. I was the goalie. Uh, you're the big kid. You can carry the pads home, so you're the goalie. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, played, uh, all kinds of baseball, uh, actually did a little basketball, did some wrestling, was a boy scout, played in the band. You know, my parents had me involved in everything. At what point did you kind of hone in on, on football and, and maybe. Thought yeah. That was um, the future? it was, yeah, it was, it was kind of late truthfully. Um, as a junior in high school, I only made the JV team. I didn't even make the varsity team. Uh, I loved playing football. It was, I loved the contact of it. That was really the, the thing that attracted me to it. Um, but as a senior, I was all state as a tight end and a defensive end, but I was only six feet tall and 200 pounds, not big enough to play lineman in the big 10, uh, where I ended up. So I went to a little bitty school in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Augustana college on a one third scholarship, which they took away after two years. Uh, so I left there and I walked on at the university of Minnesota. And you always wanted to go to Minnesota on the front end of that as well. Was there a level of disappointment that it wasn't there at the beginning for you? Yeah, it really was. Uh, they recruited me. Um, they told me I was going to get a scholarship. Uh, on signing day, somebody who was being heavily recruited by Notre Dame ended up signing with the Gophers. So they said, we don't have a, we don't have a, a scholarship for you. Uh, you know, we, we'd like you to walk on and, I was mad, so I, I left and I, I went to Augustana. And what was that like? Again, going from Minnesota, Sioux Falls, uh, South Dakota, any kind of adjustment there, getting away from home for the first time? Oh, I, I loved it. I, it was fun. I, I ran a trap line. I used to cook pheasants in my toaster oven. <laughs> I, was, I was living the life. Uh, but uh, the uh, the football situation didn't work out the way I expected it to. Uh, you know, academically it was great too. It was a very good school academically, and that's that's why you, you take a scholarship. Most most kids don't end up playing in the pros. I didn't expect to play in the pros. I just was uh, trying to get the best education I could and and uh, and go from there. Well, again, as you said, they took your scholarship away at Augustana. You decided to walk on with Minnesota. So for you, I guess it was any way possible, you're going to play for the Gophers. Is that the way you looked at it? You know, I, I, I grew up a Gopher fan. I, uh, my dad used to take me to the games. I remember watching, um, you know, them win, uh, win big 10 championships and, and do the things that they did back in the, uh, 
back in the sixties and, and uh, early seventies. So uh, yeah, the, uh, the Gophers were my, were, were my favorite team. My dad graduated from there. My mom graduated from there. You know, it was, it was, it was a dream come true to, to put on the, uh, the maroon and gold. This was 1981 and 82. What was the, the big 10 like at, at that time? And uh, I know it was kind of a rough go record wise for the Gophers during your, during your two years, but what was the, the league like? You know, a lot of a lot of guys that ended up playing in the, in the NFL. Uh, it was a great training ground for them. And, and truthfully, the reason the Broncos drafted me uh, is I had a very good game against Chris Hinton. And he's the guy that uh, that they drafted first that year and ended up trading Elway, uh, trading for Elway. So. Uh, so, yeah, I showed up on their film. I had a couple sacks against Chris and ate him up during, <laughs> during the game. Uh, so that's what that's what got me here. Yeah, 81, 82, 82 was your, your best season. You individually, uh, again, a, a tough go for the, the team. You were three and eight, but you, uh, again, you were the defensive player of the year, the, the Carl Eller Award winner for Minnesota. You were second team all Big Ten as well. What was it about you? Uh, again, a little undersized, but what was it about you that made you so good? You know, I was a defensive tackle in, in uh, at, at the University of Minnesota. I was a defensive end with the Broncos. Um, basically – it's not, it's a simple sport. You beat the guy who's trying to block you and tackle the guy with the ball. I, I ended up leading the, the, the Gophers in tackles as a defensive tackle. That, that never happens. And I didn't have any missed tackles at all that whole season. Uh, so, uh, so if you can, uh, if you can do that uh, and, and then the pass rushing thing, I, I led the big 10 in, in, in sacks tied with Andre Tippett my junior year. Um, and, and uh I had a coach there, uh, Mike Wynn at the time. He's he's passed now, but Mike Mike was the first one to tell me that there was a place for me in in the NFL if I could rush the passer, and so that was something I really uh, prided myself in. And and at one point, I had more sacks than anybody in Denver Broncos history, uh, career wise. So um, it was uh, it was a big part of my game. Uh, again, great career there in, in '82 not only on the field, but in the classroom as well. You were all academic as a biology major, and you thought maybe you were going to be pre-med. How, yeah, did, you, was, how did you balance that? Uh, it, 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 was a, it was a balancing act, truthfully. Um, I, I, uh, I was fortunate in that, uh, that most of the teachers understood, most of the professors understood, you know, I had to miss a day here or there for football, but, uh, but, you know, you, you do your best and, and plug away. I ended up, uh, I, I ended up uh, taking the MCAT test and was prepared to go to medical school if I had, if I didn't make the team. Uh, fortunately, I made the team. One of the challenges with being pre-med is you really don't know if you'll enjoy being a doctor. My dad loved being a doctor. I grew up around that. So I wanted that for myself. I knew I loved football. Uh, I had no, uh, I had no concept of what it was to be a doctor. I knew, I knew how to do physics and chemistry and biology and all that stuff, but that's really not being a doctor. So, uh, so uh, I took, I took the right path. Yeah, I'd say you did. But again, in 1983, 12th round, 310 overall. I mean, that round doesn't exist anymore. So, so take us through that moment. And I know it was a very interesting day and a long day for you when you found out you finally got drafted by the Broncos? Yeah, you know, um, I didn't go to the combine. I wasn't invited to the combine. Um, we had uh, we had a couple of pro days, so uh, um, scouts that came in there that were just general scouts that uh, reported to the teams. I did talk to a Bronco scout, but the guy who was really most interested in me was a guy from Atlanta, Atlanta Falcon scout. Um, and they said they'd take me in the middle rounds if I was available. Uh, unfortunately for me, but maybe fortunately for me, uh, they their first two draft picks that year were defensive linemen, so they weren't going to bring in anybody else. And I got a call. It was the second day of the draft. It was midnight. Uh, it was uh, Jenny Ann, Dan Reeves' uh, secretary, called me and said, Carl, we drafted you. Uh, we're going to mail you an airline ticket. If you can want to come out, uh, we're, we're ready for you to come out. And so. That was that was it. I didn't talk to a coach, didn't talk to a general manager, just just the uh, person in charge of sending me a ticket. And you were sleeping at the time when you when you got I that. Was, call, right? Yeah, I was asleep. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was not what I expected, although 
there was no draft coverage back then. There was no ESPN. There was no, you know, it was, uh, everything was a uh, telephone and, and a landline too. It, it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, so I had to sit by the phone and then I had sat by the phone all day that day. And this again, it was in 1983. It was a, a draft that's really well known for the quarterbacks. Number one was John Elway. You alluded to that as well. Did you, when did you know he was traded and, and did you think, that would have a big impact on you and your career. You know, not really. I, I, uh, he just all of a sudden was there one day. Um, <laughs> it was interesting, you know, um, the guy who owned the team at the, at the time was a guy named Edgar Kaiser and Edgar, uh, was trying to sell the team. Uh, so bringing in LA, uh, was, was a real big coup for him. Uh, we had 14 rookies make it that year. He was just, he was trying to lower the, uh, lower the salary of the team so it looked better on paper um and uh and and i mean ultimately our our um cornerstone of the team was help edgar kaiser make money i mean that that was it and then pat Bowen bought the team and a lot of things changed well again for you a 12th round guy how did you make sure that you got noticed by dan reeves the head coach at that time how did you make sure that okay you were going to have some some standing, some, some lasting power there to stay on that team. Yeah, it was, it was kind of funny. I was, uh, I was on the scout team. I mean, I was, I was as low as you could get in the NFL. I had the same number as a starter. That, that's not a good sign when they do that. <laughs> we had 110 guys in camp. So some of the numbers were repeated. Um, but I was playing scout team to the point where Dan said, get that guy out. <laughs> He's messing up all our plays. So I guess just standing out as far as you know, beating the beating the guys that were starters on the team over and over again to, to till Dan uh, Dan noticed me, uh, and it was uh, I I I could play football. There, there was no question about that. But but anybody in the NFL, if you're going to end up getting drafted, regardless of the round, you've been a good football player. Uh, the question is, can you make the jump? And the jump is is mental. Uh, the jump is. It, it, you know, physically, I'm I'm a 12th round draft pick. I was a 4940 guy. I was a 240 pound nose guard. Right, those guys don't make it in the NFL. But again, if you can rush the passer, if you make tackles when it's time to make tackles, if you can disrupt the offense, uh, they'll find a place for you. So eventually, you earned that number 77, and you kind of made that 77 proud and famous as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Greg Boyd had 77 at the time. Uh, he ended up going to Miami and, uh, and uh, they gave me 77. Uh, I, I was still a third down pass rusher, special teams player. Um, they didn't switch me to linebacker until my third year in the league. So uh, I was, uh, I, w I was 77 and, and just plugging away. And you were versatile, as you said. You were a nose tackle, you're a defensive lineman, you're a linebacker as well. Was was there one of those positions that you enjoyed more than the other? You know, I never played linebacker in my life till my third year in the NFL. Uh, Randy Gratishire had retired. Uh, we had some depth at defensive line. Uh, coach Collier, uh, our defensive coordinator, uh, Merle Moore, our linebackers coach, and Stan Jones, our defensive line coach, kind of all got together and, and said, you know what? this guy would, would help us more at linebacker. Uh, and, and they taught me how to play the position. I ended up making the pro bowl that year as an all pro linebacker. Um, it was, uh, it was where I belonged all along. I could, I could rush the passer, uh, from linebacker. Uh, I could rush the passer on, on third down situations from defensive end and from, from inside too. Uh, but, but as far as the, the, the place that really I, I fit the most was, was it inside linebacker. Was there a game at inside linebacker that you really excelled and and kind of people opened their eyes a little bit and said, okay, this, this is where he definitely belongs. Yeah. You know, I got a chance to, my first start ever was uh, against the Raiders. Uh, always the biggest game for us. Um, whoever won the first game ended up winning the second game and ended up going to the playoffs and the other team didn't. And it was like that for probably 10 of the 12 years I played in the NFL. Um, we were playing the Raiders. Our starter got hurt uh, that week in practice, and I got a chance to start. I had a big hit on uh, Marcus Allen in that game. That they still showing highlight videos. I hit Marcus and knocked him out on little uh, little uh, dump off pass across the middle, and uh, 
and uh, that was it. I, I was a linebacker. There's no question about it. The the Fox television program, the Fox Sports list, listed it as one of the top ten hits in NFL history. Uh, so yeah, I, I, uh, I that that I think opened some eyes, and I ended up starting from then on. Have you and Marcus talked about that ever? Yeah, Mark, that point? <laughs> Marcus. Marcus says I made you. <laughs> so, well, thank you for that. But I think so. maybe I had something to do with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say you made your own career. The entire career with the Broncos, eighty-three to ninety-four. But early on, you guys had some great success. Eleven win years, uh, a number of years of postseason as well. What was it about that team? And it wasn't just you. It wasn't just John Elway. But you guys were a talented team. We really were, and we played as a team. Uh, you know, we uh, we forced a lot of turnovers. We we played a very complicated defense. It was hard to prepare for. Um, offensively, ran the ball well. Um, and and if if it was close at the end of the game, Elway had that magic in the two minute drill that uh, that really uh, it, it allowed us defensively to do all kinds of things that other teams couldn't do. Uh, you know, we knew it just had to be close. It was okay if we gave up a, a, a touchdown or two. As, as, as long as we kept it close, uh, we were going to win at the end. Yeah, Elway was certainly known for that. And you go to the 1986 AFC Championship game, the drive against uh, Cleveland as well. You're on the sidelines watching this. What's going through your mind as, as you guys are down and he's leading this team 98 yards to a score that would eventually send into overtime? Yeah, I think it surprised a lot of people. It didn't surprise us. We'd, we'd seen it over and over and over again. Once again, keep it close. We got a chance to win the game. Actually, the drive just tied the game up. Yeah. Uh, you know, then and and uh, Cleveland won the coin toss. Uh, we went in and stuffed them uh, three plays in a row. Uh, they punted to us, and then uh, we moved down enough to Rich Carlos kick the field goal to win the thing. And that field goal, that, that kick went right over the top of the – uh, of the upright. I mean, if the upright was taller, it would have hit it. Uh, but the, the ref said it was good. <laughs> it was good. We're going to the Super Bowl. That was that was the most exciting moment in my life, I think, um, as as far as football goes. So just just uh, having that um, that comeback, that uh, that uh, thing you'd worked for your whole life, and you get a chance to to fulfill that. Yeah, it was the first of three Super Bowl trips for the Broncos, but but that first one's got to be a little bit more special, right? Because you just don't know if you're going to get back anymore after that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you can't you can't count on it. Uh, you can you can be an unbelievable player, uh, but a team is who, who goes to the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, guys like Archie Manning and I mean, there's tons of people in the in the Pro Football Hall of Fame who had remarkable careers and, and really never got a sniff. Dan Marino from that 83 class. So, so again, this was a Super Bowl 21. Uh, unfortunately, doesn't go your way against the Giants. You, you come up short 39 to 20. So, so what's that like? You, you, you have that moment against the Browns. You get to the Super Bowl. It's the pinnacle of your career, and, and, you, and you don't get that trophy. What is that like as a player? And how do you deal with that in the offseason, get ready for next year? Yeah, it was tough. I mean, you, you'd uh, worked your whole life to get to that point and then to – to not play well in the, in the Super Bowl, you end up, uh, I really thought the sun wasn't going to come up the next day kind of thing. Uh, but it does. And, uh, you know, players, uh, retire, uh, new guys come to the team, coaches move on things. It's all about the next year. Yeah. And, and you don't, it, it's one of the things that I think surprises, uh, people, in every sport when they get to the end of the, you know, go through all you've got the things you got to go through to win a championship or lose a championship. Uh, the next day uh, it's, it's back to work as usual. Uh, you know, clear out your locker, uh, go have your, your off season surgery or whatever you're doing and, uh, and get ready for the next year. I, I know the nuggets are probably going to be looking at that shortly here. Um, I think it's nine days until the NBA draft. You know, I mean, it's crazy. It just all of a sudden it's next year. It's like, wait a second. Can't we spend a little time on, on this championship? So, uh, so yeah, um, it was a tough thing. Uh, but I, but I think, I think one of the reasons I've been successful in life outside of football is, is that I've been through that, 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 uh, I've, I've failed on the largest stage you can possibly fail on. 
and uh, and the sun comes up the next day and, and you figure out what you did right and you repeat that and figure out what you did wrong and you throw that out and, and away you go. Um, I'm a professional speaker. I'm, you know, in, in by myself in front of crowds of thousands of people uh, and and uh, things go wrong every once in a while. But but I've been there and that's OK. I, I'm, I'm able to handle it and, uh, and and find my way through it and away we go. Yeah, I would think that'd be a little bit more nerve wracking sometimes and try to, OK, go tackle that guy with the football, right? I could do that. <laughs> no problem. And, and, and the speaking thing, I've been a professional speaker for 18 years now. I mean, that's, that's, that's been my career for a lot longer than I was a professional football player. Well, again, I'm sure some of your messages are the failures, but a lot of successes. And again, you got back to the Super Bowl after that loss. How much did that drive you guys the following year to get back there? You know, we were uh, we were driven as a team. We were uh, challenged as a team to prepare to win each game. That was our commitment. As a, if you were a Denver Bronco, you you were committed to prepare to win each game, and that was Pat Bowen's leadership. Um, we we were he was clear and consistent with that. If even if uh, even if it would help the team move up in draft status uh, at the end of the year, and, and it didn't happen very often where where we were out of the playoffs. I think we had two losing seasons in twelve years. Um, but when uh, in those years we still played our top players at at the end of the season because it was about uh, about winning. That that was the culture of, of the Denver Broncos at the time, and and. Uh, it was again clear and consistent all the way from the top all the way down to the bottom. Yeah, it certainly carried you through that season again. Another Super Bowl, Super Bowl twenty two. Unfortunately for you, Doug Williams had, had a, the game of his life, right? For the Redskins, uh, w- was it difficult to try to stop him and stop that team? Were they kind of a team of destiny at that time? You know, um, they did some things differently. Took advantage. We had a couple rookies starting on defense that uh, that they took advantage of, and it you know it was just one of those things. Uh, great coaching, uh, and and uh, you know Parcells had out coached us the uh, the year before too. Um, one of the one of the things that happened back then is you had two weeks to prepare uh, for a team, and a lot of what we did defensively was deceptive. They were moving me around. I played all seven front positions sometimes in one game, uh, putting me where they thought the play would be um, and and using me instead of substitutions when uh, when they were moving from one defense to another. Uh, one of the ways most uh, offenses tell what kind of defense you're going to have is by what substitutions are in the game. Uh, we didn't have to do that. I, I could move around and do all these different things. And, and so uh, that deceptive thing uh, – when you've got a Super Bowl level coach and you've got two weeks to prepare for it, uh, they, they they got us. Yeah, I mean, again, yeah, you mentioned Bill Parcells, Joe Gibbs. You know, you had obviously Dan Reeves, great coaches during that era in the NFL as well. Not just great players, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, got all timers. Uh, Dan was as driven to win as any person I've ever met in my life, except maybe John Elway. <laughs> I think that's why they didn't get along. They both thought they knew how to win and they were banging heads all the time. Well, you ran into another good coach in Bill Walsh with the 49ers, but you did get back to another Super Bowl, Super Bowl 24. And uh, you're talking about very good teams, the 49ers with Joe Montana at that time as well. What was it like in that matchup? And that was a game for you. Unfortunately, you got injured early on, right? So yeah, you win the game and then you, you finished with an injury as well. Yeah, that was uh, that was tough. They uh, it was on purpose. It was a leg whip. It's a, you know something that they try to hurt me, and they did. They t- I tore cartilage in both my la- my knees, and it was uh, it was very frustrating. And 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 uh, I still have a hard time with the 49ers <laughs> because of that day. Um, we had under Joe Collier, our defensive coordinator, before that we'd never lost to the Bronco or never lost to the 49ers. Um, he had a, you know, our very uh, multiple complicated offense uh, really counteracted their uh, their west or their west coast offense when they uh, uh, they had to read what you were doing and and we were very confusing for for offenses especially for uh, for Montana and and uh, then uh, in this game we had Wade Phillips as our as our defensive coordinator and Wade we were playing cover two. 80 85 percent of the time i mean it was just you know here we are try to beat us kind of yeah. thing and and that's what 
that's what the West Coast offense loves. <laughs> and they chewed us up. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I think I could have made a difference in the game, um, but who knows? Yeah, does it make it that much harder? Where Did you come back out on the sidelines? Were you watching from the sidelines after you were injured in that game? Yeah, yeah, it was it was difficult. Um, you know, I was I had invited my whole family to the Pro Bowl. The Pro Bowl was right after that, so I I I got uh, you know I got a dozen people coming to Hawaii for, mm-hmm. after after the Super Bowl. Um, you know, my my dad had just had a heart attack. My wife is pregnant. I'm carrying the luggage with with torn cartilage in both my knees. It was it was just it it was a bad week for sure. <laughs> and you've you've had a career filled with some injuries. Was, was that the biggest one? And the recovery to come back. What was that like? You know what? Um, injuries are part of football. I I, uh, I missed a total of seven games in twelve years. Wow! It was 1988. I broke my thumb against Kansas City. They had to pin it um, after the um, after the stitches healed. They uh, I played with a cast. Uh, couple weeks in the cast pulled up and broke the pin and the bone and everything again uh had a had surgery again redid it and, you know played again with the cast with a dowel inside of it so i could hold on and the cast wouldn't move and uh that was uh that was a tough year now that the, the other years the 86 87 89 we're you know we're winning a bunch of games things are going well defensively um 88 uh if you look at the games i missed uh Opponents scored nine points more per game in the games I missed compared to the games I played that year. Uh, our, our defense really relied on having me being that swing guy moving around, doing all that stuff. So it was uh, it was a tough year. As you said, when you played, you had that hand kind of wrapped like a club. Was it an advantage for you to have that, or was it hard to oh, – no, your yeah, it, yeah, it's tough if you can't grab – yeah, that's, you know, how, that's how you defeat uh, an offensive lineman. That's how you, uh, you know, catch a pass. That's how you make a tackle. Yeah, it, it was a, it was a challenge. But once again, like I said, we, uh, it, you know, it was it was it was a it was a difficult year, and it was nice that we bounced back from it the next year and, and went on and won the AFC championship again. So Dan Reeves leaves taking over was Wade Phillips, as you said, that was your defense coordinator, became your head coach in, in 93 and 94. What were those years like for you under, you know, new leadership and, and, you know, what kind of adjustments did you have to make? Yeah, it was different. Um, Wade uh, was kind of the anti Dan. I mean, Dan was, Dan was my way or the highway. Uh, if Tam, if Don, if, if Tom Landry didn't do it, uh, we didn't do it. And, uh, he was, a he was, uh, he was in charge. I mean, he was, a, he was a leader. Um, Wade came in and said, Hey guys, it's your team. What do you want to do with it? And that, that was, that was such a, such a huge change for us. We had, uh, we had been in a situation where there was one unquestionable leader. Uh, and now all of a sudden we were, uh, a task with that. And it was something that none of us had done before, and it was uh, it was a challenge. It really was. Uh, I, th- I think it's it, I think it happens a lot in the NFL. If you look at what ha- has happened with the Broncos coaches in the last couple of years, first they have uh, Vic Fangio, the uh, you know the crusty old guy, and then they then they bring in Hackett, the uh, the the you know hip hop <laughs> whatever uh, you know crazy you know. Nobody pra- nobody hits in practice kind of, kind of guy. And then now, now they brought in the, the old crusty guy again. They go back and forth and back and forth. And it's it's a uh it, it's it's very tempting if things don't work with somebody, but if, if they don't work with somebody, that's that's more I think a a, a factor uh of of the guys they have on the team. Uh you gotta bring in the guys that fit the coach and and uh they they haven't given it enough time to, for that to happen. Yeah, again, in your era, we talked about some of the coaches. You know, you didn't see coaching changes quite as often as, as maybe you do now, right? I mean, those guys were given a chance to really build a football team, and you just don't get that opportunity these days. Yeah, it's true. Uh, uh, the uh, the Nuggets just won the uh, won the basketball championship. Uh, and before that, uh, last the year before that, uh, um, the Avalanche won the hockey championship, and the year before that, the the Rams won the championship. And what does that all have in common? Uh, Stan Kroenke. 
Stan Kroenke owns all three of those teams. Uh, and he brings in a, a, a coach that he believes in and he allows them to build a team, uh, keep, you know, keeps his hands out of it, uh, allows them to, uh, to develop, uh, draft some good players. And then if they're on the edge of, of a championship, he, he's willing to pay some guys to come in and, and put them over the top. And, and that's how that worked in all three of those teams. They, they, uh, they, they, uh, built with it from within. They have a coach that they believe in and, and leave in place long enough to build a, build a team. And then uh, when they need it, when just the thing to get over the hump, they bring in a Vaughn Miller, they bring in a, a Nazem Kadri, they bring in a, a, a Bruce Brown and, and all of a sudden, you know, they're champions. Um, so, so uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm excited about uh, the new ownership with the Broncos. One of the, one of the challenges that we've had for a long time is nobody's been in charge. They, there was a committee running the team. Um, and, uh, that doesn't work. It, you, you've got, you've got to have somebody in charge. And, and, uh, I, I believe the, the Walmart folks are, are the right people at the right time. And I'm excited about this coming year and, and the future. Well, and again, you say we, because you spent your entire year with the uh, entire career with the Broncos, uh, retired after 1994. What, what led to that? Did you have an opportunity to to play elsewhere? And you know, did, did injuries were they a factor as well? Yeah, it was. I had played for 12 years. Uh, that last year, I had three concussions. Um, they didn't treat concussions properly back then. I mean, the the protocol was was how many fingers, and it's it's always two. So you say two, and you go back in. Uh, so I, I really wasn't right until April, and the, and the reason. The reason I got the concussions was I was a half step short. I just had slowed down enough to where I, I was, I knew exactly what to do. I couldn't quite get there anymore. And, and the difference between making a play and getting hit in the ear hole is a, uh, is a half a step. And uh, I, I kind of went over that precipice at that point. Uh, I went into uh, to talk to Pat Bolin at, at the end there and, uh, you know, thank him for what he'd done for me Um and, and Pat tried to get me to come back uh, and I, I just, I was done. It was, it was time to spend some time with my family, time to do a little fishing. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was time. And you mentioned the concussions. You think you had maybe 10 or more concussions during your career. You're part of the, you know, the lawsuit against the NFL as well. Uh, I guess, first of all, how, how are you now? Do you have many effects from those concussions? And, and, and you know, what do you think the long-term effects might be for you? Yeah, what was the question? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, truthfully, uh, I have had some issues. Uh, traumatic brain injuries are, are nothing to joke about. Um, I've, I've been getting some treatments. There's ways you can uh, you can counteract these things now. Um, there's a group in in Colorado called Neuroluminance. Uh, a guy named Dr. Theodore Henderson. Uh, I've been getting treatments from him, uh, seen some some tremendous gains as far as blood flow in my brain and some things that uh, indicate that it's getting better, which is which is so exciting because, I mean, I haven't played football for 28 years. I, I don't go around getting concussed now. Yeah. Right. So so the, the fact that you can do some regenerative medicine now, uh, same with my knees. I, I got, I've gotten stem cell injections. They made a huge difference. I ran three miles this morning. I've had 10 knee surgeries, right? You know, it's, it's amazing what, what you can do with, uh, with modern medicine. Yeah. That's amazing. From the concussion standpoint, again, the treatment that you're getting, which is, which is great. Uh, again, you look at your career, 12 years, uh, 1,118 tackles, 79 sacks, 16 forced fumbles, two touchdowns, five interceptions. I mean, you look back at your career, how much do you look back? And, and you've got to look back fondly at what you were able to do as a, a 12th round pick, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I try to be the best teammate I could. Uh, it wasn't my idea to play all seven front positions. I did what the coaches told me to do. Um, but, uh, but I had a blast and, and I'd do it again. It was uh, I, some of the best friendships I have in my life are guys that, that, that I went through the, the struggles with and the, the wins and the losses and the, the excitement and the ups and the downs. We see guys at their best. You see guys at their worst, uh, and they see the same. And you, uh, you, you develop life, lifelong connections, and uh, and and that to me was the the real, the real wonderful thing about playing in the NFL and playing playing for one team for as long as I did. And 
uh, today's teams are, are guys that are moving around all the time. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think they miss that. I, th I, th I think uh, I, I knew what the guy next to me was going to do. I knew what his strengths were. I knew what his weaknesses were. I could cover for him. He could cover for me. Uh, and that that's that's team sports. Uh, and, and I think it's gotten away from that. But again, you watch the Nuggets play uh, play basketball. Um, it's all about the team. You know, Nikola Jokic is spreading the ball around, making sure everybody gets a little bit of the pie. And uh, and and uh, those are those are the teams that win long term in my mind. Who was that teammate that that maybe drove you and made you a better player? You know, there was a bunch of guys that uh, that we were all accountable to each other. Um, Dennis Smith was was probably the guy that uh, he he was basically. I was in charge of the front seven. He was in charge of the back four, um, and and uh, you know he was he was the guy that uh, that to me anyway uh, was the soul of our defense. Just a, an unbelievable player and a, and, a, and a great human being. Mentioned that you know the Raiders was a big rival during that time for you guys. How about for a quarterback? Was there a quarterback that you took a lot of pleasure out of sacking during your time? You getting thirty nine <laughs> sacks during your career? Yeah, Dan Marino was fun to sack because he would get up and cuss and yell and scream at his offensive line for letting me get through. <laughs> so not only did I have the bonus of sacking him, but uh, but had that uh, I had his response. <laughs> so that was, he was a fun guy to sack. Again, two touchdowns. Do you remember the touchdowns? Of course. <laughs> when you only have two, you remember them. Uh, yeah, I, um, one of them was against uh, against the Cardinals, uh, Arizona Cardinals, and I, I um, just uh, there was a fumble, and I scooped up the ball and ran it in, and and that was it was really a tough game up to that point. We were we were just battling back and forth and they had a big strong team but they didn't believe in themselves they, they didn't play as a team and we uh i i got i scored that touchdown and and then they just quit i mean i've, I've never seen that in the nfl it, all of a sudden pff, the game was ours um and then the other one uh was kind of funny uh i'm thinking um the guy's name was dave craig uh mm -hmm. seattle's quarterback he had, he had a little bitty hands i think he fumbled more than anybody in the history of the nfl because he go back and all of a sudden the ball would drop out behind him so he goes back and the ball drops out behind him uh he bends over to pick it up and i kind of schoolyard punked him out of the way and scooped up the ball and and rolled into the end zone and the uh, um the ref came up to me after that and said carl you know if you'd have pushed craig out of the way and ha and had your uh had your teammate recovered the ball, it would have been a penalty. I, really? I played football my whole life. I didn't know that was a penalty. <laughs> it's crazy how many how many war rules there are in the NFL. Uh, and, and yeah, so anyway, I fortunately I jumped on the ball and rolled into the end zone and scored another touchdown. So I had a couple of things where I got caught from behind. I'm not fast enough to to run many yards, so I had to I had to pick up the ball like within ten yards of the end zone to, to actually score. Yeah, yeah, I grew up a Seattle Seahawks fan. I don't know if I remember that play, but I do remember Dave Craig fumbling a lot during during those years <laughs> in the okay. 80s. Uh, again, for you, 12th round pick, then you become the 17th member of the Denver Broncos Ring of Honor, or Ring of Fame, rather, back in 2001. You were inducted into that. What did that mean to you, To again, to look back and, and to be one of the best Broncos of all time? Yeah, obviously that was a, a real honor. Um the uh, the other thing that was great about that is I got to go in with my buddy Dennis Smith. Both of us went in that same year, um, so that that was a fun thing. Um, I'm I'm proud that my name's up in the stadium, and you know there's a little statue out front, and it's a it's a pretty cool deal. Um, but again, it couldn't happen without my teammates. It couldn't happen without the coaching I had, and them putting me in the position to make plays. Uh, obviously, I had to make the plays, but. Uh, but there was a lot of a lot of uh, trust and uh, and and uh, you know teamwork and, and leadership that that went into that. With your retirement, as you said, you're, you've been a motivational speaker. You've done that. You've also done some coaching as well. Uh, did you enjoy that? And 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 which of your coaches did you channel as a coach yourself? <laughs> Yeah, I coach kids, uh, and and it's it's a whole different thing. I, I remember coaching my daughter's uh, 
soccer team when uh, she was maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. And in the NFL, they, there's no punches pulled. You get, you, you know, if you did it wrong, the coach says you did that wrong. You got to do it this way. You tell a little 10 year old girl, you did that wrong. You got to do it this way. Oh, coach hates me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I figured out with the, with the little ones, you gotta, you gotta praise the one, just whoever randomly does something right. Oh, wow. Did a great job, whatever. And then they all start doing that. So, uh, it, it, it took some adjustments. Uh, I, I coached high school football when my uh, when my oldest son was playing high school football, and that was fun just to be a part of his team. Uh, he was a he was a fullback and he was a uh, a linebacker. I coached tight ends and defensive ends because I didn't want to coach him. I'd seen that happen t- too many times, uh, you know, in in, in uh, youth football where where the, the the coach is the head coach's son is the quarterback or whatever, and it doesn't never goes right. Um, so that was fun to be a part of his team. I've also done some, some coaching for the Broncos, uh, during training camp, go down and uh, work with the pass rushers. Uh, you know, I was the 12th round pick because I wasn't as big as guys and cause I wasn't as fast as guys. So I had to learn the technique of, of pass rushing and, and, and being able to pass some of that along is fun. Do you point to your name, your number up there in the, in the, you know, stadium and, does that help you with these younger guys as you're trying to? Uh, yeah, I, I, mo- most of the guys that are, are getting drafted uh, in the NFL have some concept of uh, of the past of the NFL. Uh, I, I, it's funny. There's a whole generation of of young people who know me best for Tech Mobile. I was the man in Tech Mobile. <laughs> it was you know use Bo Jackson on offense and use me on defense, yeah. right? So it, it's funny, um, but it's funny that there's a whole generation of people that uh, that that's who I am, the Tech Mobile guy. But uh, yeah, it's um, it's rewarding. Uh, I you know I don't I don't feel like I have to prove anything to anybody as far as the you know you know my my chops as far as. Uh, as far as playing football and um it's 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 been a been a great uh example i think for for young people that don't give up don't quit just because somebody says you can't do it that doesn't mean you can't do it i was uh i i once again i was the i was the last guy I picked right i'm i'm <laughs> i'm the I'm 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 the guy that uh, that nobody expected to be a pro football player, and then to to um, have the situation work out the way it did was was special. I mean, I got to the Broncos, like I said, I had a I had a starter's number. I got a hole in one of my socks first week of training camp. I went in and asked for a new pair of socks. The equipment manager said, "What's the matter with the other sock?" <laughs> he gave me one sock. <laughs> right. So, you know, where you stand when, they, when they're only going to give up one sock. So, so yeah, it was a, uh, it's a story of overcoming. Um, and that's what success is. It's overcoming obstacles on the way to your dreams. Uh, I, I think, and I saw it over and over and over again in the NFL where unbelievably gifted players would, would come to training camp and not excel. I mean, their, their desire, their passion, their mission was to get invited to an NFL training camp. I mean, my desire, my passion, my mission is I'm going to be the best football player that ever played the game. And I'm going to get better and better and better and better and get to that point. And uh, because of, of my vision, because of, of, of understanding that that I had to improve, uh, that was the difference. It, it, it wasn't my skill. Uh, my, skill was, my skills got me to the 12th round. <laughs> it's not, but I saw the first and second, third rounders come and go over and over and over again. Well, some of the messages I'm sure that are part of your motivational speaking. So, what what led to that? Just your your backstory. What what led you to become a motivational speaker and and talk to so many people around the country, around you know uh, elsewhere as well? I'm sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's part of it. My backstory is always going to be part of it. But but I think there's uh, universal keys to success that uh, that apply regardless of your profession and or, or or your desires your passions your missions for me it's teamwork with leadership being the ultimate expression of teamwork uh, courage the courage to try new things the courage to be decisive dedication which is hard work constant learning learning refusing to quit desire that's the dream the passion the mission uh, honesty and forgiveness with yourself and self-evaluation and with others and finally goal setting just reasonable short-term specific steps that get you to those desires those passions those missions 
uh, I look at things through a uh, through a sports mentality, an all pro mentality. Uh, prepare thoroughly, perform decisively, evaluate honestly, and adjust accordingly, and repeat the pattern over and over and over again. I, I see so many times that people don't admit that there's a problem. I see so many times that people uh, point fingers in other directions. Whenever there's something going wrong in your life, you're a part of it. You've, you've got to figure out what, what can I do differently? Uh, and, and then uh, allow yourself to do it. Uh, that that performing decisively that was my whole thing I mean I was a four nine forty guy not not fast enough to play in the NFL but if I took the first step in the right direction before anybody else did all the angles changed in my favor and that's just preparation going into the situation understanding what might happen having already thought about it and moving when it's time to move uh, so so I encourage people to do that in their lives when it's when it's time to go go uh, trust yourself Something you might fail, but but never moving is always wrong. <laughs> it's time, you got to go when it's time to go. Well, some good messages. I can see why you're such a successful motivational speaker. And and also, again, you decide to stay in the Colorado area and you do a lot of charity work as well for you. Yeah. Why? Why is it important to give back as, as a former you know member of that community? You know, I'm I'm. Uh... When I, when I try to look at my life and why things have worked out the way they have, to me, the, the only thing I can come up with is uh, so I can help others. I, 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 I love having the opportunity. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I had my own, uh, my own foundation for years that helped uh, young people learn to read. I have dyslexia myself, so it was a challenge for me as a, as a kid in school. Um, I, I, I work with... Uh, a number of different organizations. Denver, Denver Broncos charities, obviously, is is something that uh, that I'm excited about. Uh, you know, there's a the Food Bank of the Rockies. I've done a lot of stuff with. Um, there, there's a number of charities that that I'll uh, lend my time, lend my name, lend my money to. And and to me, that's uh, that's a uh, a requirement for for somebody in my situation. So you grew up in Minnesota, but for you, the Denver area, living in Colorado, that's that's home now. That became home. That's, for you. that's still home. Yeah. You know, I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else. Uh, com coming here in 83. Um, I've seen the town grow up uh, double in population uh, since I since I've been here. Uh, I'm a I'm a Rockies fan and a Avalanche fan and a Nuggets fan. I gave up on the on the Vikings when they passed on me twelve times in the draft. That was the end of my Viking allegiance. But uh, but yeah, I'm 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 a Colorado guy. Again, a great career, great numbers. I've got to ask you the, the Hall of Fame. You were a semifinalist, what eight years in a row? Yeah, ten. Row uh, ten yeah, ten till they okay. now I'm in the senior committee. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that that you have to assign a position to somebody to be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, I played all those different positions. If, if, if you say, okay, Carl's a, a, a pass rusher. Eh, I didn't have enough sacks to be a, a Hall of Fame player. Um, but I did, a lot of times I was in pass coverage. I was playing linebacker. Um, you know, if, if you say, well, you know, Carl was an inside linebacker. Well, I don't have as much and many tackles and interceptions as guys that were yeah. just inside linebackers. Uh, I think I think one of the one of the things that uh, that they should look at is is your impact on the team itself. Um, what what I did nobody's ever done before. Probably never will do again. Uh, once again, that wasn't my choice. Um, that was what the uh, that's what the coaches asked me to do. Um, we had a great team. We won a whole bunch of games. Uh, if, if you look at the film and I'm playing against other Hall of Fame players, uh, I believe I was on top most of the time. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it, 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 I can't vote. Um, one of the other interesting things is that one of the things I used to say is, is I'm not making any more tackles. Well, I found out that uh, – there's a lot of tackles out there that were not recorded. The uh, for some reason the Broncos didn't record, um, didn't didn't enter uh, playoff game tackles in in yeah. their in their records. Um, I have no idea why uh, they they do now. Uh, the other teams did, Broncos never did. So there's uh, I believe I played 14 uh, 
playoff games. There's 14 games of statistics that, that I don't have on my statistics, which is which is kind of crazy, but it, it's it's reality. Maybe something to put you over the edge. And, and as you said, you're, you're you know your versatility was a plus during your career, but now it may be hurting you. You think during you know trying to get into Maybe. the Hall of Fame? Yeah, I mean, I I, I try to. I try to figure out why, um, and and that's the only thing I can come. It's interesting. Um, yeah. Randy Gratishar is a great linebacker for the Broncos for ten years in the NFL. You know, All Pro and and you know Hall of Fame over and you know uh, Hall of Fame statistics had more tackles than anybody in the history of the game per per season. Just, but people look at those statistics and say, you know, that can't be real statistics. So you know, coaches write that down. So. And then they look at me and they go, well, he doesn't have enough statistics. So like, what do you want? <laughs> it's got to be one or the other. I, I don't understand. How do you look at that? Do you, do you need to be in the Hall of Fame to, to, you know, support the career you had? Or are you fine with not being in there? You know, the Hall of Fame um, would be great for me for my speaking business. Um, but other than that, it doesn't matter. I, I, I The guys that I played against and the guys I played with, know exactly who I was on the field. I, it, the rest of it, you know, it, whether, whether the, the voters uh, remember or don't remember, that's, that's beside the point. CarlMecklenburg.com, where people can go about your speaking business, book you for, for appearances. Are you on social media as well? How can people I follow am. you? Yeah, yeah. Carl Mecklenburg is uh, just at Carl Mecklenburg everywhere. I mean, it's fortunately, I have a, a pretty rare name. <laughs> so there is a... Uh, there is a politician in Seattle with my name, but other than that, <laughs> there's no nobody else. You got a rare nickname as well. I, I want to ask you about the albino rhino. What, when did you get that nickname? Who gave that to you? Yeah, I got a, a teammate in uh, a teammate in at the University of Minnesota gave me that nickname, and uh, a guy named Kurt Bankston. Um, and uh, Kurt. Uh, is, you know, just another defensive lineman at the University of Minnesota. Somehow it followed me to the to, to Denver. I think I think that's what happens with nicknames, right? Uh, you you uh, get out of the car and uh, and there's a snake on the ground and you trip and you fall and you, and all of a sudden your nickname is Snake, right? I mean, it's just just how it happens. So so yeah, uh, still still follow me. I also have another nickname, uh, Snow Goose, that. Uh, same thing actually followed me from Augustana to Minnesota to Colorado, which is, is crazy. Well, last week we had the penguin Ron say for the Dodgers on. So now we have the snow goose and the albino rhino on this week. We're becoming a zoological <laughs> show here. I thought we were a sports show, but uh, great <laughs> nicknames, especially seventies, eighties athletes. Uh, you've got to love it. And uh, I've appreciated your time here today and the great stories. And, and again, Hopefully you're one of those guys that uh, we can see in the Hall of Fame at some point. Certainly the, the numbers support that kind of induction for you. Well, I appreciate it, Mike. It's good to uh, good to be on your show and uh, have, have enjoyed it too. Have, have a wonderful time, a wonderful day and uh, hi to everybody out there. Again, if you're if you're interested, uh, I've got a book out called Heart of a Student Athlete. It's also on my website um, and uh, uh videos of me speaking if, if you're you're looking for a speaker i'm your guy there you go great message you've been doing a long time and a great message that you have out there and again thanks so much for your time today my pleasure well our thanks to carl for joining us here today sharing his amazing story again from a 12th round pick to 12 years in the nfl maybe someday in the pro football hall of fame as well you can find out more on carl at carlmecklenburg.com once again, we thank you for watching, for listening, and invite you to subscribe to our show. Be sure to help us grow this show. More great guests coming your way soon. Until then, we'll see you next time in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Have a great day, everybody.